that the first major scientific report on climate change came out in 1990. Um, our emissions now are almost 70% higher than, than they were when we first expressed any concern in climate change. Right. Since the last major IPCC report, the last UN report, uh, in 2007, we put out an additional 200 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So this has been over the last two decades when we've claimed to be concerned about climate change. All that has happened is our emissions have gone up year on year. And not only that, but the rate of increase of those emissions has actually also gone up. So we have squandered the carbon budget that we, that we had back in the 1990s or the Earth Summit in 1992. Mm -hmm. We now have very little of that carbon budget left. The latest science report that came out from the UN, the one at the end of September, pointed out how small that carbon budget um, is now. And again, the, again, the, the, the latest report from the um, uh, that's come out from the Tyndall Centre here, uh, uh, shows again that, th that this budget is incredibly small, very tight. So the question then is, if we are serious about this commitment to two degrees centigrade, our obligation internationally that we sign up to and our leaders sign up to every single year, if we're serious about that, we have to say, well, what, how does that play out for us globally, but then also within nations? So what we've done, we've, we've divided that up amongst the nations around the world and then think within those nations, what are the sorts of changes would have to come about? And we've said equity is a really important part of that. So a lot of the work that's been done looks at it globally. We've said if you split the world into sort of poorer parts of the world and wealthier parts of the world, what are the implications for the wealthier parts of the world? And the rates of reductions that we would now have to bring about in countries like the UK, the rest of the EU, the US, Australia, the wealthier parts, we would need to bring reductions of about 10% every single year, preferably starting from our last bit of work, uh, major work on this was 2011-12. From then onwards, we were saying 10% every single year. So it's even tighter now, that budget. Now, that sounds impossible. So our question then is, well, t living with three or four or five degrees C temperature rise looks impossible. And we're also told that staying to two degrees C almost looks impossible. So the future in that sense is impossible. But it's only impossible because we have a very limited mindset about thinking about these issues. So we've tried to sort of go beyond that and said, well, if we start to say, what, could we have to, what would we have to do that was radically different from where we are today to bring about the, those sorts of rates of change? And actually, when you start to play that out, it's not quite as severe as you, as you first think. Most of the emissions within our own countries, most of the emissions around the globe come, come from a very small proportion of the population. Probably somewhere between 40 to 60% of the emissions come from 1% to 5% of the population. Yeah. Um, so that gives us a much, much better handle on who needs to reduce those emissions and therefore what those policies might look like. Okay, but 10% is, is, um, sounds, uh, sounds savage. I mean, how, how, how would A countries even consider cutting it by 10%? Are, are there any you know, clear, clear sort of examples? And is, is this, would this be financially ruinous or is this sort of financially possible you know, within the context of countries wanting to maintain their growth? Well, I prefer to say it was economics rather than finance, because I think there's an important distinction between the two. It's economically ruinous not to do it, because that means we get hit by climate change. So I say the impacts of climate change are, are, the, are the greatest concern here, so in terms of economics. So we have to do this. There isn't, really an, uh, there isn't really a plan B other than trying to deal with huge levels of climate change, which would be, which would be de devastating for us, the way we're heading at the moment. So we're then saying, well, is this, is this technically viable? Is it viable in terms of... Um, the behavioural changes need to be brought about. Just give some very simple examples. And now these are slightly sort of EU focused, unfortunately. I apologise for that. But in the EU, we have a carbon, we have a labelling system for efficiency of items. Refrigeration, which is a, probably the, the second largest energy consumer in our households, you know, next to heating and, and, and some parts maybe cooling. Um, if you look at the, the labelling we have, an A-rated fridge, which sounds like quite a good fridge, an A-rated fridge, uses about 80 to 85 percent more energy, more energy than an A++ fridge. So we already make A++ fridges that have no price premium, that look the same as the other fridges. But because we have this obsession with choice, we won't regulate the fridge manufacturers to say all of your fridges must meet this minimum standard. So you can buy a C, D and E fridge as well as an A fridge, all of which are rubbish. So there you think that's one area where you could make a massive reduction just by changing the standard on the technology. We've done the same work with cars that you can do the same thing with existing cars, without electric cars, without hybrids, without public transport, you can make probably 40 to 50% reductions in about 10 years just by having more stringent efficiency standards on the existing types of cars that we build and sell. So these are things that won't be economically ruinous. We're already doing these things. We're already making these, these appliances. It's not enough, but what we're saying is sector by sector, if you make the best that's available, the, the standard that they all have to meet, then that only drives innovation and it rapidly drives emissions down. Now, on top of that, we have to then think about what are the behavioural changes we need to make. Um, and let's be blunt about this. You know, the emissions only come from a small proportion of us. So I would have a guess that 95% of the people in COP are the high-emitting part of the world, you know, along with our colleagues, our friends and our family. We know who those people are. 
And that's, the, that's beneficial because we know, therefore, who the policies have to be aimed at, people like us. But it also makes it difficult because we're the people that develop and come up with the policies. So it's a bit like the, you know, the fox is having to protect the chickens in this sense. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult um, circle to square. Yeah, I mean, the issue of um, equity has been uh, discussed a lot here. The Indian Environment Minister was downstairs talking about how equity needs to be, um, you know, one of the sort of core parts of this whole process. Um, but, you know, how, how can you also ensure that larger developing countries invest in the right kinds of technologies, the right kinds of energy technologies? Because I guess it's all right India talking about equity, but when they're building coal fire power stations while they're going out of fashion, that's not going to help the, the, greater, the greater good, the greater problem of rising emissions. No, I think we have to think about, again, this quite carefully, that within those countries, we, we often blame, I know a little bit more about China than India, we often blame, say, China for all sorts of things. Firstly, I, I have a, um, a MacBook that was made in China, using their emissions, because we no longer, we don't manufacture those sorts of things in the UK. So we're, off, we're offshoring some of our emissions anyway. But also, the Chinese may well be building some new coal-fired power stations. They're also closing down their more inefficient ones. And people often point out that China builds one power station, coal-fired power station every week, but they don't point out it builds about one, ga one wind turbine every hour, that it has more solar panels than most of the rest of the world put together, that the price of solar power has come down around the world because the Chinese have been producing them much cheaper than anywhere else has been. So at the same time that these countries may be part of the problem, they're also part of the solution. And we, of course, have gone through um, our development process through, with, with access to relatively cheap energy that allows us to live these sort of lives that we live today and have the welfare and the prosperity that we have now. And I think it's unreasonable to expect other parts of the world, the poor parts of the world, not to have that. Now, having said that, they need to be developing their energy systems as lower carbon as possible. And I personally think it is, it is an issue of reparation that those of us in the wealthy world who are asking these other people no longer to go down a high carbon energy system route, we should pay the difference in the price between the low carbon energy options, if there is a difference in the price, low carbon energy options and the higher carbon energy options. That's, that's our moral responsibility because we're saying to them, you can't develop like we did. And that seems to me to be an unfair thing to request of other parts of the world. So we need to be helping them as much as we can, and yeah, probably financially. But let's not bear in mind, these, these countries will not only suffer from climate change, probably more than many of us in the wealthy parts of the world, but they're also trying to do something about it as well. Just a final point. I mean, in a sense, listening to you, you know, it makes sense economically, it makes sense morally, uh, but it doesn't seem to make sense in any way politically. How can you, um, what work have you guys done to make this more politically, uh, I don't know, appetizing to, um, to leaders? Because that's, that's what it's, that's what it's going to take, isn't it? We can sit here, you know, for as long as we want and political leaders can turn up as they have done today at the ministerials and say the great work they're doing. But unless they really buy into it, um, unless they can sell it to their electorates, it it's seems it's going to be hard. Yeah, that, that's a very subtle question that includes lots of different areas. So just touching on a, on a couple of those. Firstly, the leaders come here and sit out there negotiating. And do they see any passion? amongst the people here? Do they see any sense of urgency? We had the AR5, the main UN report, come out in the end of September saying, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're basically stuffed if we don't do something very soon. I don't get any sense of that here. There, no sense of that passion or urgency for, that we need to drive change. So if we don't have it, those of us that are informed and engaged in this debate, how can we expect our leaders to have it? So I don't think we should separate the leaders. They're the, they're the cause. They are the problem. We are all in this, in a sense, we have all this together. We all take some significant responsibility for it. So we need to be driving the leaders much, much harder. The second thing about this, I think we've been dominated by, um, without sounding too pejorative, what we call economists. I often call them astrologers. Um, I'm not really sure that the, the economic framing of society has been particularly beneficial in its own terms. And we were having some economic problems around the world now that have been nothing, nothing to do with by climate change, by economists and finances not understanding the system that we actually have anyway. And to think we're going to solve climate change using the same sorts of mechanisms, I think, is a real mistake. So if we could wrestle climate change away from the finances, away from the economists, and put it back in terms of uh, civil society, in terms of what the engineers can offer, what the scientists can offer, what the wider range of expertise in society can offer, I think there's real scope for driving emissions down and having low carbon, climate resilient societies. But whilst we're dominated by this idea of carbon prices and, and carbon trading, I do not think we can bring about the, the levels of reductions that are necessary Necessary. But all of the opportunities are out, are out there for us to grasp to bring about the changes that are necessary. But until we, as a community, show some, some sort of clarity and imagination of our thought and some rigor in our analysis, and until we drive our policymakers to sort of think differently away from always being dominated by economics and, and price, then I think we're, we're, we're resigned to emissions continuing to rise.